right, you guys ready for retina? But first, we have to go to Barcelona. So I don't know if you ever saw when the Tour de France uh, finished, went, you know, did a, did a round in Barcelona once. They did a bunch of laps around here. So this is the National Museum up there on the hill. And I'm not sure what these two pillars do, but they're pretty cool. And there's a bunch of bikes racing around them. It looks, it looks cool. So that's the National Museum. And this is from the walkway. If you go up there, it's kind of nice because Barcelona is it's on the water, but it does have some hills around it. So it's got the look of a little bit of a valley. And it's got quite a bit of green around it. So this is kind of looking down to where those two pillars were. You can see they've got a little stadium down here where they do, they do temporary concerts and things. The proverbial lions, you know, guarding the stairway when you go up. And this is looking out into the city. So this is the fortress on top of Mount Juic. And you guys are too young to remember the 92 Olympics, but that's where the 92 Olympics were. When they had, you've heard of the Dream Team? You know, that's where the Dream Team played. Is there a pointer in here anywhere? I didn't bring my Yoda pointer, so I don't think that's a pointer. <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, we're going to talk about retina. And, you know, when we talk about the retina, there's going to be a theme that keeps bouncing back over and over and over in ophthalmology. And the question that I put out is, what do ogres, onions, and retinas have in common? Layers, exactly. So we're going to pound the layers of the retina. So when we look at the retina, first thing is you want to look at some definitions. And so when you look at the definitions of the retina, the definition of the macula, basically what retina people call it is the macula is the area within the arcades. But if you look at it pathologically, the macula is also the area where you have more than one ganglion cell. And so to a pathologist, that's the macula. Unfortunately, most of these line up. And so Really, the area within the arcades is the area that pathologists call the macula. All right, so when we're starting on the layers, we want to start first at the vitreous and then work our way down to the sclera. So we're going to just go around the room, and you can't hide back there, Renee, so, so it doesn't matter. I'll still find you. So we're going to start on the vitreous side. So first layer of the retina. Reese. Uh, inner limiting membrane. Inner limiting membrane. Eileen. Nerve fiber layer. Nerve fiber layer. Who's back there? Julia. All right, Renee. Inner plexiform layer. Okay. Who's next? Nico. Inner nuclear layer. Inner nuclear layer. Outer plexiform layer. Outer plexiform layer. I don't know you. Yeah, I don't know the answer either. Are you? Are you? Uh, <laughs> He's a medical student. Oh, you're a spell guy. You don't count. Outer <laughs> nuclear layer. All right, so outer nuclear, nuclear layer. And you guys are. Oh, you're observer? Okay, so you don't get questions. No, no, he knows everything. Oh, you know it all? <laughs> well, I don't. So yeah. <laughs> he knows everything. He knows all. Well, that's it. That's, that's good. Well, it's nice to have somebody in here who knows all. All right, so we had left at the outer nuclear layer. So what do we call this layer right here? See, they put pressure on you now. They said you knew everything, so that's the hard part. That's where the photoreceptors are, exactly. So this is the photoreceptor layer, okay? And then you can see that the photoreceptor layer is kind of divided into an inner segment and an outer segment. So inner segment, outer segment. And then this layer right here. Oh, John, good timing here. Uh, CRPP. Retinal pigment epithelium. All right, so we're going to come back down here again. What layer is that right there? Uh, Choriocapillaris. Choriocapillaris. And then you go to the medium vessels and the larger vessels of the choroid, and then eventually the sclera. So when we look at a little bit of a higher power here, what we want to do is we want to trace a photon of light. So it comes through the cornea, it's refracted. It comes through the lens, it's refracted more. It goes through the vitreous. You know, the retina is really upside down because light has to go all the way through the retina to get to the rods and cones, which are furthest away. So, you know, at first you'd think, gee, the retina should have been designed with the rods and cones on the outside. 
you know, facing the vitreous, but that's the furthest away from its nutrients. And so the reason that the retina evolved this way, I'm oh, sorry, Ted, Ted Cruz one yesterday, the reason that this was designed intelligently this way is that you want the rods and cones to be near their blood supply because they're very highly metabolically active. And so the rods and cones are actually down here, so a photon of light has to come all the way through. So a photon of light comes through, it hits what part of the rods and cones that starts the actual mechanism that lets you see light? All right, so where does the rhodopsin live? Um, kind of in the outer segments. Exactly, so the outer segments here, you've got, it's, it's like a stack of coins if you look at it on an EM. And on that membrane, out there is the rhodopsin. And so a photon of light hits it, it does the flip from cis to trans. And then what that does is that starts a hyperpolarization that eventually starts an electrical cascade going. And so the rods and cones, start the cascade going. Now the inner part of the rod and cone cell layer, this is where the cell nucle this is where the cell has its, its, its um, you know, activity that are there. You know, it's got mitochondria in there, it's got all kinds of things in there. And then of course this layer right here in the outer nuclear layer is where the cell body of the rods and cones lives. Okay, so then that signal then leaves the, you know, first layer right here, and it goes to the outer plexiform layer. And what happens there, Eileen? Uh, they photoreceptors synapse with the uh, other cells. And okay, let's, let's do the cascade first, and then we'll worry about the other cells. So with, with the um, inter-nuclear layer cells. So with the bipolar cells, so the bipolar cells. And so it synapses with the bipolar cells. The bipolar cell bodies are here in the inter-nuclear layer. And then that signal leaves out the axons here and synapses in this layer right here with what cells? Ganglion cells. Ganglion cells. Okay, so then the axon of that ganglion cell leaves the ganglion cell. Renee, where does it go from there? It travels along the uh, nerve fiber layer to the optic nerve and then tracks back to the optic triad and the optic tract and the lateral Exactly. So that axon that leaves this ganglion cell goes all the way back through the optic nerve, through the chiasm, through the radiations, all the way to the lateral geniculate body. That's a really long axon. And so anywhere along that pathway, that can be interrupted and can cause damage along this. So very, very long axon. So the other thing when you look at, at the retina is there are um, some other cells in there beside the cells that we just talked about. And they are located pretty much in this inner nuclear layer right here. And so, Nico, tell me a couple of other cells that live in that inner nuclear layer. Mule cells. Okay, and what do they do? Uh, their support structure, they, they make the uh, sort of limiting membrane and sort of limiting membrane as well. Okay. All right, so the Mueller cells live here and they're kind of a microglial cell, if you will. And they, they do some, have some support. They've got little foot plates that come all the way here and along here. If you look at really low power, those little dots that are along there will form a membrane. They'll call that the outer limiting membrane. It's not really a membrane. But then also their foot plates will go all the way up here too to the inner limiting membrane, which is between the retina and the vitreous. And so that's not, again, not a true basement membrane, but it is a little membrane-like structure. Horizontal cells, what do they do? So they uh, form synapses uh, between, the, um, between the bipolar cells, and they use, they're used to create the um, larger, the, what's the word? They're like the on-off. Yeah, they, they kind of, they spread horizontally, if you will, and they touch multiple different areas where the, you know, nerve fiber, where the, I'm sorry, the uh, bipolar cells interact. And so these are the beginning of processing of vision right here. And so they really do go out. And Helga Cole, who was a PhD here, who's now retired, um, did some wonderful EM pictures that they colorized and made into videos. And she gave a proctor talk a few years ago of the interactions there. So this is really where visual processing begins. It's not 
actually in the brain. It's actually right here in the retina. So they start, and then there's one other cell layer here, Dr. Conrad, or one other cell type, I should say, in there. Endocrine? Endocrine cells. And you know, endocrine are kind of like bipolar. They're the ones, again, they think of them as big octopuses. They put their tentacles out all over the place, and they're involved in early processing of the image. All right, now, where are we now? Uh, I'll, let's, I'll give you a break again. John. Uh, All right, more specific. There was multiple layers of like implant cells, so macula. Exactly, so this means we're in the macula. And so if you look at the ganglion cell layer, you see that there's multiple ganglion cell layers here. And the other thing interesting is look at the fibers from the outer plexiform layer from the outer nuclear layer here through the outer plexiform layer, they are running horizontally instead of vertically. What layer do we call that? Wait, still me? Still John, sorry. Um, isn't that the inner plexiform? Well, there's a specific area in the macula where these start running horizontally instead of vertically. That's the Henley's layer, Henley's layer. Oh man, I sound like the guy on Jeopardy, you know, Art Trebek, Henley's. He always sounds like he's so smart because he knows all the answers anyway. <laughs> when they miss it, he'll like, he'll say it like he knows it. So you see how it's running horizontally here. So if you think about why that is, this is the center of the fovea. And in the center of the fovea, you want those light rays to come in unimpeded. And so what happens is, is you see that the retina really thins out here, and you've got all these mostly cones here, a few rods, but mostly cones stacked up here. And so those have to connect to the ganglion cells over here. And what happens is, is that they have to run this way in order to do it, and so you get the fibers running horizontally instead of vertically, and that's Henley's layer. The reason that that's important is, that is where you get cystoid macular edema, and that's why it has that funny flower petal look to it when you look at it. Now, when you look at the fovea, the fovea is responsible for fine vision, and so the foveal <laughs> cones, bless you, have a one-to-one -one connection between the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells, and so it's one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. So all of these cones have to link to a ganglion cell, so all those ganglion cells over here get stacked up, and that's why it's multiple cell layers thick. In the periphery of the retina, you might have a hundred rods hooked up to one ganglion cell. And that's important because the periphery is involved in summation. And so your central fovea gives you fine vision. That's what lets you have the detail of the vision we have. But the periphery helps you to see movement and to see things going on in the periphery. Why is that important? Well, you know, when we were out on the, the tundra and, you know, saber-toothed tigers are chasing us, you want to see that movement out there. There's a survival factor in it. Whereas the central fovea eventually developed as we became more adept at seeing fine near vision. And that's what we think of as our good vision. So you look at it, all these ganglion cells stack up here and they're connected, at an oblique angle by the Henley's layer. And I think we've talked this to death, so we'll go here. All right. So. What we want to do now is get into specific diseases that can affect the retina. And one of the most common problems that you see a lot when you're looking at the retina is vascular diseases. And so we're going to, I think we came around, all right, back to Reese again. So you see a lot of X states and then uh, just hemorrhages in different layers of the retina. So do you have a more pointy shape? All right, so this is a good picture because it kind of shows us a lot of different things going on. So why do flame hemorrhages look like flames and why do dot blot hemorrhages look like dots and blots? Just the layer of the retina. I guess the nerve, the nerve fiber layer hemorrhages have more of a flame shape. Yeah, so that nerve fiber layer, as the axons come out of the ganglion cells, they turn around the corner and then they run along the surface and then into the optic nerve. And so if you get hemorrhages, along that surface layer, they're shaped like a flame. If you get hemorrhages deeper, then they are called dot and blot hemorrhages. Um, Eileen, what else do we see when we're looking at the vasculature here? Um, the um, making? Yeah, look at the, 
little sausages right there. When the arterioles cross the banules, you see that sausaging, that AV nicking. What causes that? Exactly. So you can actually almost see the arterial lining. People will start calling this silver wiring or copper wiring. And so when you get arterial sclerosis, the arterial wall thickens, the column of blood narrows, and then you see as it crosses over the sheath where the vein is, you'll get sausaging of the vein. All right, Julia, what is this right here? All right, so that's called hard exudates and, and the reason they do that is they used to in the olden days even before I was a resident maybe when Crandall was a resident you know they had to distinguish between hard exudates and soft exudates and they used to call these little fluffy white things up here soft exudates now we know now those aren't exudates those are actually little focal spots of ischemia called cotton wool spots and so but these are called hard exudates, and that's where you get leakage of not RBCs from the vessels, but the actual serum. So it's lipid rich, it kind of looks yellow, and so those are hard exudates. So what could the etiology of this be? Hypertension. Exactly, this could be hypertension. That could be severe diabetics too, because diabetics can get, looks like this, but this is a severe hypertensive retinopathy. So you see if you like this, you want to be really you know, careful to measure the patient's blood pressure. And, and this is another patient with high, high blood pressure. And Nico, what are we seeing um, right here? We see some uh, hard exudates as well coming from the pure macula. Um, What's the shape of those hard exudates? You see those little radial lines. People will call these, they almost look like little starbursts or, you know, like little, um, if you look at the Sun Valley sun, you know, it's got the sun rays coming out of it. So you've got that appearance to it. And again, that's because those exudates are going out in Henley's layer. And so they kind of spread out in that little sunburst pattern. So hard exudates here. You see these hemorrhages around the disc. Look at that disc. It looks kind of more congested than normal. And so when you have hypertensive retinopathy, you can actually get disc swelling along with it. And so if you look real carefully, maybe the beginnings of some disc swelling right there. And then, of course, this is a severe hypertensive retinopathy where you can actually get frank papilledema from, from severe um, hypertension. This was a patient that actually came to clinic when I was a resident, and we were worried, oh, my God, we were going to work him up for... CT scan of the head, because there were no MRIs then yet, and we were going to do all kinds of scans to figure out why they had papilledema. And a medical student said, well, did anyone check their blood pressure? Medical student. So we were all embarrassed. We pulled out that thing that you put on the patient's you know, arm and that other thing you put in your ears, and we pumped it up and listened, and it was 210 over 110. So this patient had a hypertensive crisis, sent him immediately to the emergency room for treatment, and so this is severe, you know, grade five um, hypertensive retinopathy. All right, what do we see in right here, Brian? So, kind of looks like very pale fundus, uh, loss of vasculature, very red spot, so probably super all right, so this is an ischemic retina, star for oxygen. It's very white, pale, swollen. What is the cherry red spot? That's where you can see the colloidal vasculature because the phobia is so thin. Exactly, so that's like a window defect. So remember, the, the fovea gets its blood supply, the deeper part of the fovea, from the choroid. And the choroidal blood supply is still good, and so you have that thinning of the superficial retina, so you can't have the, all that edema in there to block it off, so you actually see that foveal blood supply shining through. So that's a classic cherry red spot from a central retinal artery occlusion. All right, Chris, what are we seeing here? So you see you've got ischemia in this area here, and so that's when you get a branch artery occlusion. Now, are artery occlusions usually embolic or thrombotic? Thrombotic. 
No, you had a 50-50 chance. <laughs> embolic. Embolic. Ah, very good. Very good. So. I was just saying it with confidence. So exactly. You said it with confidence. So you're making a guess. Guess with confidence because you get credit one way or another. So it's actually most commonly embolic when you see the, the branch artery occlusions. And so you'll sometimes be able to see a little, you know, emboli of some kind, either blood or cholesterol or whatever. And so usually embolic when you see those. Now, what we're showing here is what? Chance to save yourself. So, first of all, where are we? Look at these funny things all the way around here, this artery and vein. Renee, did I skip you that last round? I think I did. I just realized that. Renee, yeah. where are we? I'd have to assume that the second tissue there is in the original orbit. Not quite in the orbit yet. Where are we? Well, yeah, I guess this technically is part of the orbit. More specific. Who said nerve? All right, this is the optic nerve. And so remember, when the central retinal artery comes into the eye, it comes through the center of the optic nerve but the central retinal vein runs right next to it. So if you look right here, this is an extremely arteriosclerotic artery right here. Look at all that lipid in there. That artery is narrowed down to that right there. So this is, um, you know, the guys from Crown Burgers, you know, who eat lunch there every day. And you can see all that pastrami stacked up in the artery there. And look how narrow that is. So you've got that narrowed artery and so it's very susceptible to clots because it's narrowed down. It's more susceptible to, to clots and to emboli. So the most common cause of a central retinal artery is arterial sclerosis that leads to emboli. What's the most common cause of a central retinal vein occlusion? Again, Renee. Oh, you're asking me. Uh -huh. um, usually it's uh, due to atherosclerosis of the artery. Exactly. So you see the artery and the vein as they come in share kind of a common adventitial area around them. And so the most common cause of a central retinal vein occlusion is that fat cholesterol filled artery pushing against it, which then causes stasis and not emboli, but thrombi. So central retinal vein occlusion is you get stasis and thrombi formation, but it's arterial sclerosis next to it that causes it. So this is the result of a central retinal artery occlusion. And, and John, tell me a little bit about the blood supply to the retina. Why do you have this picture if you've had a central retinal artery occlusion? Um, the, retina, the central retinal artery supplies the inner layers of the retina. Roughly how much of the inner layers? About, well, two-thirds of the whole retina, so that's a good way to remember it. So the inner two-thirds of the retina gets its blood supply from the central retinal artery. The outer third gets its blood supply from the choroid. So if you look at this, you see that the ganglion cell layer is totally wiped out. Almost all of the inner nuclear layer is wiped out, so you just got you know, a tiny bit left there. But then you see the outer nuclear layer and the rods and cones are still alive because they're getting their blood supply from the choroid. So the outer third gets its blood supply from the choroid, inner two-thirds from the central retinal artery. All right, we are back to Reese. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Um, just, uh, looks like there's just a lot of blood um, in the retina. The vessels look really tortuous. It's kind of just swollen looking. So what do you think caused this? Exactly. So this is a central retinal vein occlusion. They call this the blood and thunder retina. I have no idea what that means, but it's, it means it's, you know, bad. You know, you look a lot of blood, a lot of thunder. So blood and thunder. So you see that if you have a complete central retinal 
vein occlusion, you get backup of blood all the way. I mean, and so you see just diffuse backup of blood and as opposed to this, which is, what is this right here? more of a branch vein. Now, when the branch vein occlusion occurs, where does it usually occur? Um, at the AV crossing. Exactly, so again, it's arteriosclerosis. So you see that silver wire arterial and where that vein crosses up, where you had that sausaging, you can get stasis there and then you can get a branch vein occlusion. So not only do you see blood, but what are these guys right here? Little cotton wool spots. So you can get ischemia there too. So you can have central retinal vein occlusions, and then you can have more focal branch retinal vein occlusions. And this shows you what a central occlusion looks like in a globe that's been cut in half. And you see that that blood goes all the way to the aura serrata, from the optic nerve all the way to the aura serrata. So it's just a diffuse blockage, and you get blood backed up everywhere. And here you can see what the retina looks like. You get ischemic changes but you get a lot of blood in the retina and you can even get exudate here in the retina. So central retinal vein occlusion can cause a lot of damage. Eileen, what else do you worry about beside acute damage in a central retinal vein occlusion, say several months out? Uh, and what causes that? Ischemia. Exactly, so you can get chronic ischemia and then ischemia will produce these magic humors which you know we call now like VEGF among other things. And so what happens is, is these humors will make abnormal blood vessels grow. So when you get a central vein occlusion and it is ischemic, what's the most common place that you get neovascularization? Actually, no. Nico. The iris, okay, you got it, that counts. All right, so the iris and so, you know, you can get neovascularization in the retina, but what you really worry about when you've got a, a ischemic central retinal vein occlusion is you get neovascularization of the iris. And so then you can get secondary neovascular glaucoma. So you worry about that if you have lots of ischemia. All right, now, Nico, we're, we're kind of, this almost looks similar to that first picture that we showed. And tell me what you're seeing here. Right. So lots of hard exudates. Seeing some uh, dot plot convergence and flame. Dot plot, flame. Um, what are we seeing here? So are those like the cotton wool spots? Those are the cotton wool spots. So this isn't hypertension. What else causes a look like this? Symbolic event. Actually, the most common. Um, most common, what should I call it? Most common vascular disease that, that can affect the eye. Diabetes. Diabetes, exactly. So this is diabetic retinopathy. This is a nice picture because this shows you all of the changes of background retinopathy. Dot blot hemorrhages, heart exudates. But when you start to see cotton wool spots, that means ischemia is beginning. So now it's phasing into pre-proliferative retinopathy. So this is a diabetic. And the first thing that we see in, in diabetics, Brian. So those are tiny microaneurysms. Yeah, so, so what we can do, you can do what's called the trips and digest. You can take you know, a piece of retina, you can digest the stuff around it and leaves the vessels behind. And you can see the first finding of diabetes is you can get these little microaneurysms. So you start to have Pericytes drop out, vascular walls get weakened, you get microaneurysms, eventually these can leak and cause some of the other findings that you see. All right, what are we seeing right here? Chris? Uh, it's more exudate with hemorrhages. Yeah, so you can see this is more macular hard exudate. And so these are really difficult to treat because once you get that hard exudate in there, it's very lipid rich it can really disrupt vision. And so you can't really laser that. that. That destroys tissue just as badly. And so you, you really want to treat the diabetes, get that under control, and try to prevent that you know, macular edema and macular exudate from occurring. And here you can see this is exudate. It stains that nice pink color on H&E stain in the outer plexiform layer, the layer of Henle here, so macular hard exudate in, in diabetes. Renee, what are we seeing here? Uh, multiple cotton, wool, wool spots. 
Not most spots. And what did we say causes those? Ischemia. Of what layer? The nerve fiber layer. The nerve fiber layer. And so here we have the nerve fiber layer. You get some focal ischemia. All those ganglion cells get swollen. And you get that wispy cotton wool look because it's in the very surface layer. And so it gives you that little cotton wool spot. But that's the, it just kind of follows the way that the fibers run. Now, these can come and go because as the ischemia goes away, it's not that that recovers. You're left with a little dead spot right there, but it won't be swollen. And it's the swelling that you see. And here's a close-up. These are actually the ganglion cells here that are ischemic that become swollen. So that's what causes the cotton wool spots. And again, that's a sign of pre-proliferative retinopathy. All right, John, what do we see in here? All right, so we see diffuse hemorrhages, but there's something else besides just hemorrhages. What's going on right here? Oh, proliferative uh, vascularization. Exactly, so neovascularization. And so you're actually going now from pre-proliferative to proliferative retinopathy. So now we're seeing neovascularization. And when we divide up neovascularization, we kind of divide it up into two things. We call it neovascularization of the disc and neovascularization elsewhere. So this is NVE, this is elsewhere. This is peripheral neovascularization. And then of course here we have your classic neovascularization of the disc where you see the Medusa's head. Remember Medusa in Greek mythology with the snakes coming out of her head, and so this really does, it looks like Medusa here, neovascularization of the discs. What was interesting is in the 1970s, lasers were just being invented, and ophthalmologists were getting xenon arc lasers. These things were great. I mean, the laser was like the size of a VW van, you know, and it would put out these thousand millimeter spot sizes, you know, you would just cook it. And so people said, well, if this is neovascularization, we should, you know, zap these, these abnormal vessels with laser and it'll make them go away. And so they would zap the heck out of the optic nerve head. Well, they quickly found out that the patients would immediately go blind because you would kill off the whole, you know, um, you know, retina around here. But at the same time, they were taking these xenon lasers, they were blasting the peripheral neovascularization. What was happening is when they blasted the periphery, the neovascularization on the disc went away. And so as people understood more what was going on, you actually treat the peripheral retina to kill off ischemic retina in order to cause the neovascularization to regress. And so you treat the entire peripheral retina now with laser, and that actually causes regression centrally. So you don't treat the neovascularization itself. You treat the ischemic retina, and then the neovascularization goes away. So they quickly realize you don't treat the optic nerve head, you treat the periphery. And this is what can happen when you don't treat it right away. So I guess we'll start back again at, at Reese. What are we seeing here? Uh, it looks like a proliferative membrane. Proliferative membrane, and you can see here this, this stock of gliotic retinin. So when you get hemorrhaging, you can have stimulation of gliosis, you can get tractional retinal detachments, you can get all kinds of problems, and of course you can get this. Uh, Eileen, what do we see in here? Uh, it looks like a uh, raised retinal hemorrhage. And what shape do we call this? Uh, yeah, raised retinal hemorrhage. For both. For both, exactly. Good. Oh, I love that. What can you do <laughs> Too bad Custis, our old fellow, wasn't here. So. <laughs> So it's boat shaped, exactly. So you see it's got a flat top because it's kind of pre-retinal. It's, it's in front between the retina and the posterior vitreous. And so it'll have a flat top on it and then kind of around bottom, so boat shaped hemorrhage. And so the idea is you want to prevent this from happening in the first place by treating the ischemia and causing it to go away. Nico, so what happens if you don't treat the ischemia? All right, so what do we call this? And people would call this rubiosis, you know, red iris, so rubiosis iridis, 
We used to call it when it got this bad, ropiosis, because those big dilated vessels look like ropes, so this is ropiosis, uh, neovascularization of the surface of the iris, secondary to chronic ischemia. And what can happen when, when you see this? Let's go back to Brian. What, what do we see here? What tissue are we looking at? So this is the iris in cross-section. And you can see, it looks like you kind of see little blood vessels on the surface. So neovascularization of the iris. And then the pupil margin is turned in. It's like tropium. Yeah, so you see that? That posterior pigment epithelium is being pulled around the corner. So what happens is when those vessels grow on the iris, they have some contractile elements to it. So they'll eventually contract. and that pupillary border will get pulled around the corner and you'll get pigment epithelium there. And so when you look at these, they'll actually have a little black margin around where the pupil is. And so this is ectropion UVA. What are we seeing right here, Chris? Uh, uh, those vessels going across the retinal mesh Yeah, so you see a closure of the angle there. And what do we call that when it's Secondary angle closure, but we call this a, a peripheral anterior synechia, or PAS. So you see that the angle is closed off as those vessels grow, and then you get the peripheral iris sticking to the cornea, and so it closes off the angle. So you get secondary angle closure, again, from ischemia from the retina, causing the iris neovascularization. Now, there's one other thing that can, that can happen to the iris in diabetics, Renee. Um, you can see lacy uh, vacuolization. Exactly, lacy vacuolization of the pigment epithelium, and that's from the chronic ischemic changes. And last but not least, John, what part of the eye are we looking at here? Ciliary body, good. What stain are we do using here? PAS. PAS. And so what is this showing us? Uh, basement membrane. Basement membrane. And what do you make of that ciliary body basement membrane? Very thick. It's very thick. So diabetes can cause thick ciliary basement membrane. So I took a picture very similar to this when I was a Dave Apple fellow. And he took my pictures and he turned them into the board of ophthalmology. And so when I took boards for real, I, I looked and my picture was on there. And I said, wow, diabetic, you know, it's thick and ciliary basement membrane, man, I'm good, I can get this. And then the, the question said, and you guys will love it, those of you who haven't taken boards, it's just a killer because it's a two part question. They said, a patient with this picture would have A, you know, creatinine clearance of, you know, B, perineal nerve velocity of, <laughs> and so I, well, they're diabetic, they're going to spill creatinine, their nerve velocity is going to be slowed down. I said, wait a minute, what's a normal creatinine clearance? What's a normal peritoneal nerve velocity? So that's how they separate wheat from chaff on boards. And so even if you know the answer, you still don't get the answer right. But it was kind of fun to see my own picture on the board exam. I love that. I went, I took that picture. I know this. So thickened ciliary body basement membrane in diabetes. All right, so back to Reese again. What is this? Someone with measles, you know, of the retina? Are those laser spots? Those are laser spots, exactly. So we've treated the peripheral retina with laser, panretinal photocoagulation. And basically the way the laser works is, is we still use mostly an argon laser, mostly argon, but the laser is absorbed by the pigment epithelium. It creates heat. It kind of kills off this part of the retina here, you'll see the choriocapillaris seals off. You get a loss of the retina there. You have normal retina here and here, and so you do the laser spots. People have argued a long time about how the laser works. It does definitely decrease VEGF and other vascular you know, humors that, that cause vessels to grow, but some people say they do it by you know, allowing more oxygen to come through this area where you've cooked it with the laser. Other people have argued, said, no, 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 you just kill off ischemic retina, so there's less retina to make these bad humors. And so I don't know the answer to that, but this is what a laser spot looks like. Eileen, what the heck is this? This is the neovascularization. So what are we looking at? What kind of study here? Uh, this is a fluorescein. 
Yeah, do they still do fluorescein now with all the OCTs? They actually do inject it still? Okay. No. But, so what's going on here? This is kind of a weird looking picture. Yeah, so you see this black area here, that means that there's no fluorescein getting in there, no blood getting in there, so it's not perfused, and you've got this neovascularization kind of at the interface, they call this a C-fan. So what entities can you get this in? Sickle cell. Sickle cell, yeah. Now you could also get it, I think, retinopathy of prematurity will sometimes look like this too, but when you've got this C-fan and then this area of non-perfused periphery, this is a case of sickle cell. And so this is a patient with severe sickle cell, and this is, a, again, just kind of showing you what it does to those blood vessels. So chronic sickle cell can cause little microvascular occlusions and cause this little beady change to the vessels as you're there. All right, let's look at some other things here. Nico, what are we looking at here? Yeah, exactly. This is a macular hole. And so this is one of those pictures where I say it's really apparent because even the intern can get it. So <laughs> this is one of those intern. Maybe even a student would get this. I don't know. But we'd have to see. But certainly the intern can get it. So there's a macular hole. And then this is a close-up showing you that. What is this thing right here? Is that like a, a string of blood coming out of that hole? What is that? Trick question, sorry. That's the little rod that, that the person looks at when the photographer's taking the picture. And so when you have a central defect, you can't focus centrally, so they tell you, look at the end of that stick that's there. That's actually the artifact of the stick there. So there you see that macular hole, and you see that there's a little area of edema, a little area of swelling around it. And this is the only picture I could find. I'm sorry, because people don't you know, take out macular holes and send them to us. And so this is an old, old picture of a macular hole and then some of the edema around it. And so we now know that it's a, 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 an area of traction that's around that that causes the hole to happen. So the retina guys will go in, peel off all the traction, put a bunch of gas in there, have the patient sit face down for a period of time and hopefully seal that hole off. A little bit more subtle right here. Brian, what are we seeing here? Exactly. So this is probably an epiretinal membrane, and this is a more dramatic one. Even the student, again, could see this one. So, But you see right here that these vessels are being yanked into this. You can actually see the epiretinal membrane on the surface of the retina, but sometimes these can be really subtle, and you just don't, don't see them as well. And so this is, again, here's that rod you know, pointing down for the camera. What kind of picture is this? Brian, yeah. Yeah, or a red free, I guess you would call it. I so, right? Yeah, red free, red free. You know, I knew what you meant. So you can see right here, red free picture, and you see the vessels being pulled into this little membrane on the surface and being stretched out. And so that's an epiretinal membrane. And, you know, when you look at it with the OCT nowadays, you can really see a nice area where you've got that wrinkled membrane and you can get focal areas where you actually get traction on the retina from the epiretinal membrane. And here again, you can see on the OCT, that nice epiretinal membrane there on the surface. Pathologically, what causes an epiretinal membrane? What kind of cells, once again, Brian, what kind of cells cause it? So the glial cells? Yeah, the, the astrocytes. And so you have in the retina a few little scattered astrocytes, and if they gain access to the surface of the retina, they can grow and you'll see they cause this irregular folding pattern on the surface. So I like to think of it as like a wrinkled piece of cellophane when you get on the surface. Chris, what are we seeing here? Mm, looks like a bunch of, you know, it's like soft drooping 
All right, so a bunch of Drusen. Where are Drusen located? All right, so actually right under the RPE. All right, so this is a good thing. I purposely left this until now. There's one more layer that we didn't talk about. So what is the membrane between the RPE and the choroid called? Brooks. Brooks membrane. And how many layers are in Brooks membrane? Two. All right. Renee. Five, and what are the five? Uh, you have the basement membrane of the RPE. Basement membrane of the RPE. You have collagen layer. Collagen layer? Elastic. Elastic? Then you have another collagen. Another collagen? And the basement membrane of the choreocapillary. Basement membrane of the choreocapillary. So the way you think of it is it's a turkey sandwich from upstairs at the judge. <laughs> you have the bread on both sides. The RPE, basement membrane, the choreocapillary, basement membrane. Then you have the turkey, which up there is pretty collagenous. So you've got two collagenous layers. And in the middle, you've got your elastic American cheese layer in there. So elastic in the middle, two collagen layers, and then two basement membrane. So technically, a drusen, if you really want to be specific, is actually intra-brooks. And so it's actually underneath the RPE, but still along what's left of Brooks there. So this is where a drusen sits. And this is a little bit of a bigger drusen. We call this a soft drusen. So you see, it's a big drusen here, but look what it does. It disrupts the RPE over it, which then disrupts the retina because the retina gets its nourishment from there. So it disrupts the retinal nourishment. So that's a drusen. And these are, again, a picture of some softer drusen. So the soft drusen are bigger. They don't have such a distinct edge to them. And here you see RPE broken up, soft drusen right there. Okay, what do we see in right here, Jun? Uh, All right, so you've got some areas there where the pigment is clumped up here. The RPE is clumped up, but look at the rest of it right here. Uh, what do we call that when you get this kind of RPE totally wiped out, just a little bit left there? Yeah, you guys, I'm sorry, you guys in PATH don't see retina pictures, so. This is called geographic atrophy. And so this is, again, a, a variation of macular degeneration. You can get diffuse disruption of the RPE and eventually leads to geographic atrophy, which can cause loss of central vision. And when you look at a patient with geographic atrophy, you see that here's Brooks membrane right here. You can still see it. But look, the RPE is totally wiped out. There's some soft drusen here and here. And look at the surface retina. It's just wiped out. I mean, there's just no retina left there. So that's diffuse geographic atrophy with macular degeneration. All right, what are we seeing right here? Well, you yawn, Harry's. Well, there may be a small pigment epithelial detachment, but what's going on right here? Why do you have that elevation. greenish gray color with yeah, elevation? Like the, yeah, so you've got subretinal neovascularization, and, and technically, when it's got that dark, dark color to it, it's actually probably even sub RPE neovascularization. So it's neovascularization underneath the RPE, which gives you kind of that greenish tint to it. And when you look right here, I had to get this out of a book because, again, I don't have this beautiful picture, but here is Brooks membrane, choriocapillaris. Look right here, these vessels from the choroid are broken through Brooks and they're spreading under what's left of the RPE there. So subretinal, actually even sub-RPE neovascularization. So for some reason in macular degeneration, you'll get that focal break in Brooks and then vessels will come from the choroid and start growing under the RPE and eventually under the retina. So what we used to do with these, our treatment was that you would take a laser and you'd just blast the heck out of it where it was and that would seal it off and the patient would go from, you know, 2200 to 2200 and you would say, yeah, but we kept you from going to 2400. So 
It's like the old analogy they used to use in Vietnam. The generals, they used to bomb the village so they could save it, you know? Well, we bombed it so we could save it, you know, so the communists wouldn't take it over. So we used to bomb the retina to save what little of it was still left with, with laser. But now we can inject with anti-VEGF and actually cause that to shrink down before it gets to this point. So this is a severe subretinol, which is the red, and sub-RPE, which is the darker hemorrhage. And so this is the um, kind of the end stage of a subretinal neovascularization. And then what that can do, uh, Eileen, is that can induce this change, which is Don't you love when they try to help you and you go, what the hell is that? Lego blo blocks, you know, coming together? What is that? Well, just step back when you don't say, God, what is that? What kind of tissue does that look like? Um, it looks like some sort of fibrous Yeah, so it's like a connective tissue. And so remember, there's no fibroblasts there in the retina, but there are astrocytes. And so this isn't fibrosis, but it is... Gliosis, exactly. So if you have subretinal neo, you can eventually get subretinal gliosis, and this is what we call a discoform scar. So end stage neovascularization for macular degeneration, you get this discoform scar underneath there. All right, Nico, what are we seeing here? So some kind of focal lesions affecting the deep retina and the choroid. And then here, where are we there? Uh, macula. Macula. So what could cause a picture like this where you've got macular disruption and then some focal, discrete, round lesions in the periphery? I'm not sure, but the infectious. Infectious, good. What kind of infection? Not a toxo, but a histoplasmosis. And so this is a classic picture of histoplasmosis. And you have to be technically uh, correct. They call it presumed ocular histo, because by the time you see this, you don't have any active beasts in there. And so they just, you know, the blood tests show there was histo, and people live in the proper area where histo lives. And so you see these punched out lesions, they call them in the choroid peripherally, and then you can have this macular lesions here. So this is presumed ocular histoplasmosis. Now this is a little bit of a, a different look to the macula here. Um, Brian, what do we see in here? So, loss of the foveal reflex. I'll give you a hint. This was your last cataract patient at the VA. Exactly. So this is the so-called cystoid macular edema. And the reason they call it that is when you do the fluorescene, you get this late leakage, and it has this flower petal appearance as you get leakage of fluid into Henle's layer, again, into the outer plexiform layer. So this is cystoid macular edema. And the most common cause that we see for this is post-op. You know, you can see this from chronic uveitis and other inflammatory diseases, but usually post-op is what the cause is for cystoid macular edema. And here we have, what part of the eye are we in? The macula, because look at the ganglion cell layer. And sure enough, out here in Henley's layer is exudate. So this is chronic cystoid macular edema. Chris, what are we seeing here? Exactly, so kind of a bullseye pattern. So what's your differential when you see a bullseye in the macula? Uh, probably the number one thing, like plaque window toxicity. Yeah, nowadays it's plaque window toxicity, and this is why we watch these patients so carefully, because we don't want to let it get to this point. Once it gets to this point, it may not be so reversible. So we're doing tests on our plaque window people to find out signs of toxicity early before you get to this final bullseye maculopathy. And when you do a fluorescein angiogram, how would you describe this? Uh, so, like a perifoveal hyperfluorescence. Yeah, so it's not a leakage, it's just a focal 
area of some, of some staining that you see, and it, it really demarks that bullseye pattern to it. So you can get it from other medicines besides Plaquenil. Chronic melaryl toxicity can give it to you. Some antipsychotics can give it to you. But it's usually medicine-induced. Um, Renee, what are we seeing here? Yeah, so where are angioid streaks located? Yeah, so they're deeper. This at uh, first glance you say, oh, some funny vessels here. But if you look, here's the vessels up here. These are under the retina, so they're breaks in brooks. So what classically causes this? There are a number of entities, but I guess the first that comes to mind is pseudocyanosoma. All right, and so this is the classic plucked chicken look to the skin in a patient with pseudoxanthoma elastica. So it's a disease that affects the elastic tissue. Brooks membrane becomes brittle, and it can have some focal breaks. And so you get the classic plucked chicken look to it. What do we see in here? John? Okay, so the problem is, is when you're not sure what the answer is, you tend to talk slow and really quietly. And that makes it easier, so. So there's a triad here, and what I want to point out, look at the disc, waxy pallor of the disc, markedly attenuated arterioles, and then this bony spicule pigment pattern in the periphery. Does that ring any bells? Uh-huh, what do bony spicules usually? Retinitis pigmentosa. So this is the classic picture of retinitis pigmentosa. And this is more in the periphery. You see this bony spicule pattern. And when you look at it, what causes that is the RPE gets really disrupted, the pigment goes up, and it tends to deposit around the vessels, which gives it the bony spicule look. So this is retinitis pigmentosa. All right, back to Reese. What do we see in here? Um, there's a kind of soft yellow deposit under the fovea. Okay. So what pattern does this fit? What disease? Um, could be Best's disease. All right. So this is the classic kind of sunny side up yolk look to Best's disease. Now, you can get this usually in kids, but in adults, they can call it vitelliform type dystrophy. It's the same thing. You get this, this um, sunny side up egg look, and you get these deposits underneath the RPE in best disease or in vitelliform dystrophy. All right, Eileen, what do we see in here? Uh, you're seeing uh, white spots uh, along the arteries. I'm going to call them flecks and stargarts. Yeah, so this is classic for stargarts or fundus flavi maculatum. And some people call these pisiform, and I don't get it. They say these look fish-like you know, Pisces the fish. So from what language? <laughs> from the Greek, of course, from the Greek. So they call this Pisiform or fish-like. So this is classic Stargardt's fundus flavi. And what you see is you see these deposits in the RPE cells. And what are those usually made of beside pigment? Lipofusin. So you get lipofusin stuffed into those RPE cells in, in Stargardt's disease. All right, Nico, what do we see in here? Yeah, so you see this kind of yellowish, irregular thing. Now, when you see a hazy fundus, you look through there, they call that the headlight and the fog because you're seeing the optic nerve head through this fogginess. What causes the fogging? Actually, blood can do it, but in this case, it's inflammatory cells in the vitreous. So you've got an inflammation that's spilling over in the vitreous, and then you see this little lesion here. Now, if you let it go and you look at it a few years later, it may look like this. So what do you think could cause this look? You already said this once. Uh-huh. Short-term memory. <laughs> Yeah, so this is toxo. So toxo, you get this classic later on, you get these lacunar 
areas where the, everything's been wiped out, choroid, retina, all you're seeing is sclera showing through, and then you get this pigment around it here. But when it's acute, you get, it's a chorioretinitis, and so you get this spillover into the vitreous, the headlight and the fog, and this is the classic look at the end once it's settled down. Now, there still may be some toxocysts sitting in there, and they can actually reactivate sometime later, so it's toxoplasmosis. And when you look at the retina in these cases, here's your RPE and your retina, and you can see it wipes out the RPE and the retina from the toxo. All right, Brian, what are we seeing here? So, uh, white retina, hemorrhages, looks kind of edematous, worried about CMV retinitis. All right, so this is your classic picture of CMV, and people call this the tomato ketchup look, or the pizza look. So you'll have hemorrhages, you'll have exudates, you'll have edema. Now, fortunately, we're not seeing this as often now. When the AIDS outbreak really came, you know, really came of age, you know, when I was a resident, uh, we saw this a lot because we didn't understand it. But now with triple therapy and antiretrovirals anti and all, we're seeing this much less frequently. In fact, the last CMV I saw actually wasn't an HIV patient. It was a patient who'd had a bone marrow transplant and was immunosuppressed. So chronic immunosuppression can give you this look. But this is chronic um, CMV, cytomegalovirus. And when you look, what's interesting is you can get intra- nuclear um, inclusions, you can also get intracytoplasmic inclusions. So they get in the ganglion cells, you get these big swollen ganglion cells from the cytomegalovirus. Okay, so that's from Mount sitting there on a cold, blustery day in Barcelona. And I think we've killed Barcelona, if I'm not mistaken. And so uh, I'm gonna have to come up with something different for next week. So next week is Optic nerve. So know your optic nerve. All right.